Hey guys, you got Christina Gilchrist here, also known as the Dialysis Warrior Blind Chick. And I'm here with my Moosey boy, my Moose the Palm Ski Service Dog. And... Hey, uh, what about me? Oh, yeah, I have Michael Gilchrist who's here. The caretaker. And this is Living on Dialysis Podcast. And this is a disclaimer. We are not doctors. This is just the opinion of Living on Dialysis Facebook group. And always follow up any advice you have with your team and your doctors. And again, this is just an opinion. So if you don't like it, tell me yours. Bye. All right, guys, this is Michael. And Christina. And this is uh, Living on Dialysis podcast. And today we are super excited to talk to Angel Duncan. She has an amazing accent, so I'm super excited to hear her tell her her story. So, Angel, are you ready? Sure. All right, go ahead. I am 47 years old. I am located in Northern California in Sacramento. I'm from North Carolina. That's why I talk a little plain. I have polycystic kidney disease. And I found out when I was around 23 years old after I had given birth to one of my children. Oh, wow. I I had a cramp in my side, or what I thought was a cramp. And it hurt really bad for like three days. And finally, I was just like, I got to go to the emergency room. I can't take it anymore. So I went to the emergency room, and the doctors asked me, I knew that I had kidney disease, and I was like, uh, no. <laughs> oh, my goodness. Uh, I had no idea. And he was like, do you have high blood pressure or anything like that? I said, yeah, I've been taking blood pressure medicine since I was about 14 years old. Oh, goodness. And he was like, well, we're going to set you up with a nephrologist in the next couple of days. You really need to be seen. So did they so, associate the kidney disease with your high blood pressure? No. No, okay. They did not when I was younger because no one in my family had ever had that problem. They just attributed to the fact that I was on the go all the time. I was constantly going, and I drank Pepsi like it was water. Mm. Like, I drank more Pepsi than anybody under the sun. So they just kind of talked it all up to that. Because other than that, it was pretty healthy. Okay. Wow. So, so with the with the Pepsi thing and all that stuff, did they did they say you had diabetes too, or just the kidney I do disease? Not ha- I'm actually the opposite. Um, wow. Okay. I have, yeah, I am hypoglycemic. My A one C is four point three, <laughs> so it's very That's, low. Wow. I have, to, I have to, you know, I have to make I have to set my clock to make sure that if I don't eat a lot to make sure that I'm drinking something sugary or eating some candy or something. Oh, wow. Okay. Yeah. I am a lucky person who I do not have the diabetes with the rest of my issues. That's the first question people ask me when I tell them I'm on dialysis. Oh, you have diabetes? Right. Oh, oh, I, I get the same thing. I'm like, well, a lot of people attribute this. There are over 100 kidney diseases that people can have. Right. Yeah. Diabetes is just one that affects your kidneys. Right. It's just a pretty common one. It is. But once I found out that I had the policy, when I went to the nephrologist, he explained to me what it was and told me that my kidneys would just eventually get bigger and bigger and bigger. And boy, was he not lying. My kidneys are huge. I look like I'm carrying twins. Really? I'm, I'm, I'm very small everywhere else except my abdomen. And my kidneys are, one of them is 29 or 30.9 centimeters, and the other one is 30.8 centimeters. Plus, I do PD dialysis. So, my oh man is all swollen up. <laughs> so, do you have any kidney function right now? I have very little. Um, my, my creatinine is like 12, 7, 12, 12.75. Okay. So it, it's very minimal. Like 
Yeah. I, I might have about a quarter, may, maybe half a cup of urine output a day. Okay. Sometimes okay. more, sometimes less. I gotcha. Yeah. Wow. Okay. But I mean, it's not bad. Um, so are your, will your kidneys eventually just, cause I know with me, my kidneys eventually shriveled up and now they're like the size of quarters. Will your kidneys. No, mine will just continue to get big. big, big. So until will mine, they, will they have to remove them? Yeah. Mine have to come out before I can get the, get a kidney. Okay. My, there, there's no room in there for a third kidney. Not oh. even in my my kidneys are so big they go down into my pelvis where they would generally put the third kidney so yeah. there's no room there for it and they have to take it take them out huh. so my surgery will be i need typically i need a living donor yeah so they can schedule it all at the same time right. yeah that makes sense okay yeah. so do they associate your kidney disease with your kidneys growing like that yeah well, it, your kidney, when you have PKD, your kidneys get these cysts on them, and those cysts are, they just grow on top of each other. So in, in, it makes the kidney get bigger. Okay. This is what um, Uncle Jim. Uncle Jim has. Okay. So are you the first one in your family to have this, or? I am. I am the genetic mutation. Okay. I, had a, I had to have, gen, what's it called, geneticist done. Yep. Genetic testing done. Mm -hmm. And I am the first in my family to have had it. Okay. Well, I have three children, and one of them has it. The girl has it. Oh, goodness. So is it showing up on her yet? or? Um, She's 22 years old. Well, she'll be 22 years old next week. And the only issues she has is she has weight gain. Yeah. But she... She also has, which this also is very, very common in people who have polycystic kidneys. She also has um, polycystic ovaries. Oh, so, my goodness. Yeah, some of the problems that you have when you have that is you have jawline acne real bad, and that's the only issue she has. Wow. Huh. Is she going to be able to have, like, kiddos or? Um, uh, I'm, well, she, I'm sure she could, but she doesn't want any. Oh. I got you. Okay. She, she doesn't want to. Huh? Okay. There you go. She's she's one of she's a thrill seeker. Ah, that's cool. So she's she's all about herself right now, and I, I'm okay with that. She's she's a she's a senior in college in North Carolina, and Aww. yeah, she works all kinds of jobs. She works DoorDash. She does. Um, she works at like a, it's like a YMCA, but not a YMCA. Oh, okay. And she works uh, at a shoe store. I can't remember what kind of shoes it is. Bands, like, you know what I'm talking about? Bands, yeah. tennis shoes. Yeah. That's what she works. She works at a band store. So when you first got introduced to knowing that you were going to have to do dialysis and stuff like that, can you tell us that process a little bit? And how your kidney function was at that time? Um, when I moved to California, I was late stage three um, in my failure process. And I started I started getting, I, I couldn't sleep at night. Hmm. Like, I was like, I don't understand why I can't sleep because I never had a problem sleeping before. And I was thirsty all the time. Like, Ugh. I could just drink gallons and gallons and gallons of water, which I still can. And I was like, I, asked, I went to the nephrologist and I was like, why am I like this? He said, this happens a lot of times in this part of kidney failure. And he said, it's, it, it will get worse before it gets better. But he said, when it starts getting worse, you won't want to drink all that water. Yeah. Because you will start like being waterlogged it'll fill you up and you can't get rid of it yeah and that's i never had that problem personally um i did want to stop drinking the water though because it did feel waterlogged yeah I, um i i started getting sick real bad like sick to my stomach the first time i was on dialysis 
Aww. I mean, I was sick to my stomach all the time, and I had these just incredibly bad headaches. And the doctor brought me in, and he said, well, he said, your labs are kind of bad. He said, I think it's time to start dialysis. And I, I think my GFR was like 11 at the time. Yeah. Okay. So they started, they did a fistula on my left wrist. Now, I'm only five feet tall. I'm a very small person. I wear children's size watches. <laughs> and, I mean, I'm just very small. So when they put the fistula in, he said, I'm very sure it's going to work. It never had a thrill. Never, ever. huh? Ever. Oh, goodness. And he said... You know what? He said, I'm positive I can get it on the right side. I'm right-hand dominant. So he really didn't want him to do it over there. But I was like, okay, whatever. So I let them do it on that side three weeks later. So here I am with my left arm already bandaged up. And I'm going back to have the right one done. And he said the right one had a thrill when i come out of the emergency room the nurses said or out of the operating room the nurses said it had a thrill i came home and you know when you get them you kind of swell up so it's hard to feel i i listened to it with a stethoscope i never heard it ever but they said it was there but i never heard it so we're gonna say it wasn't there so you never felt it either neither one of them okay okay then let's see i got that one the first one and then the second one three weeks later i got the next graft um four weeks later oh my so goodness I got, girl. yeah i got the graft in my left arm and when i tell you my arm swelled up i ain't even kidding my arm was about three times the size it normally was <sighs> and but it had a thrill and i was so excited and it kept a thrill for about eight months. Okay. And it, we used it, and it did real good. And then it died. And I was going every every four or five treatments to have to have it be clotted. Oh, wow. And have you oh, ever wow. had that done? Yeah. I don't know about you, but... And I have a pain tolerance like nobody's business. I gave birth three times with no drugs. Wow, very impressive. So, when when I tell you that the declot procedure hurt me to the point that I screamed, Aww. I'm not kidding. I cried. And the second time I had to have it done, I wouldn't go. I was like, No, I'm not gonna do it. I can still use the bathroom, I'm good. I'm not gonna I'm not gonna, you know, die. <laughs> right. So after that six days he was like you have to get it done or it's not going to get accomplished i said okay so i went and had it done and at that point they knew that i was really upset they gave me so much medicine that it i was, was gonna say work. why didn't they knock you out <laughs> they, did that. they didn't knock me out i sure didn't feel no pain oh well, there you go right. well good and i had i had that one done uh, about eight more times to the point where the doctor said, you can't take any more, your arm is done, you can't, it, it, I'm not going to do it anymore. So they put the the catheter in my neck. It was in there two days and fell out. Oh, <laughs> fell <shit>. out. Okay. <laughs> it fell out. So I so, had to go back and get another one. So when, when it just yeah. fell out, I mean, did you cough and it popped out or did you just fall Snag out? It on something? It, I was asleep, and I woke up, and there it laid on the, on the bed. Really? Oh, my goodness. Yeah, no blood, no nothing, just laid there. Huh. Right. Wow. Okay. I went to Your the body's like, no, thank you. Yeah, it was like, no, thank you, exactly. <laughs> I went to the emergency room, and they looked at it, and they were like, did you pull it? Nope. They were like, how did it come out? I don't know. It just came out. <laughs> so... They replaced it, and I had dialysis in the hospital that day, and I came home. And then that one, it it didn't come out, but up top, you could see it. Like, I don't know how to explain, but the plastic part of it was sticking out of the top of my neck, you know, in the insertion spot. Really? It was like, yeah. Out here, they don't 
um, stitch them. So oh, okay. Like, I have to replace it. So here I go again for the third one. And the third one irritated my neck real bad. Mm. I have red hair, so everything irritates my skin. Everything. Yeah. And where it was had my skin so irritated, they was afraid I was going to get an infection. I mean, it was itching. I was wanting to just oh. claw my skin out. Oh, my goodness. So they took it out. And I, sat, I stayed in the hospital for like eight days so they could keep a check on me like I wasn't going to, you know, swell up and die like a big blue belly. Oh, my goodness. So they were like, if you think you can deal with life without dialysis, let's just not put another one in and let you heal up. Oh, I was like, really? I'm okay with that. Yeah. So for two years, I didn't have anything left. And in 2018, I moved back to the East Coast to take care of my mom. And it got to where I couldn't even walk to my car without being out of breath. Oh, no. Yeah, I wasn't swelling up or anything. I just couldn't breathe. Yeah. And I came back home in November when my mom died. And... um. I was like, I think it's time to go ahead and get my dialysis stuff going. Yeah. So it went in for another graft on my arm. I can't remember which one that was, which number that was. Oh, my goodness. I think, it, well, it was the last one. And we had the graft done, and I waited like two or three months to start my treatment. And I went into my old clinic and started my treatment. I done two treatments and I clotted. Oh no. So, and I've already been through all kinds of um, tests to see if I have a, a clotting disorder, which I do not. I just clot really easily. Wow. And I had that done. I went to have the declot procedure and it hurt so badly. And it took, you know, normally they don't take but about 30 minutes to do. I was in the operating room for four hours. So, so people know. So why does it hurt so bad? Do you know? I have no idea why it hurts so bad. It's like when the, I think it's when they put the balloon in there that makes it hurt so bad. Well, and the balloon is like lined with razors, so you're you're causing damage in there while oh, yeah? you're getting it done. Okay. Yeah. Uh, I, I've I'm just never, I, I've heard of the process. I've just never looked into it. So, okay. All right. So pretty the, much the they're just scraping your too. vein. When they put that dye in there, that's kind of what hurts too. Okay. So they gave me more drugs. He said, and this is exactly what the doctor said. He said, you've had so much medicine. I cannot give you any more. He said, You've had more, I think, fentanyl. He said, you've had more fentanyl than Michael Jackson did when he died. He said, I cannot give you anything else. Wow. Okay. I said, okay. He said, I can't. He said, I'm just going to stop. He said, I can't get it fixed. I said, okay. So I didn't know what the plan was. My nephrologist is great. He came and seen me in the hospital, and he was like, I'm just going to send you to the, um, the general surgeon see if he can put a PD cath in you. Okay. He said, I don't think we can, but I'm going to see. So he went and seen a different surgeon than I seen the first time. Who told The first one told me I couldn't do it. So I went and seen this other one, and he said, yeah. He said, I have a robot. And he said, that robot can do it with no problem. Wow. So on my birthday, here we go with five o'clock in the morning to get PD surgery. Oh. Now the PD surgery was on my birthday and it, that day was not bad, but I was also extremely medicated. Right. Yeah, yeah, right. of course. Yeah, medicine. <laughs> and when I came home, I couldn't move. I was in pain. And a lot, I think a lot of it has to do with how big my kidneys are and how they had to move things around in there to get it accomplished. Yeah, I'm sure. But, oh, my God, I, I can't get off my couch. 
But three days later, I was in so much pain, my husband had to take me back to the emergency room. And they couldn't find anything wrong with me. They just, I guess, chalked it up to me being a big wuss. (laughs) He said, you just can't handle pain. I've been told that before. (laughs) I I had a nurse tell me that one time. She said, you just can't handle pain. Ladies, lay down here and let them do it to you and see how good you handle it. Yep, exactly. But... That was on a Saturday. On Monday, I was really, really sick and, like, very sick to my stomach. And I I started getting lethargic. And my husband was sitting on the computer doing uh, some of his paperwork. And I was sitting on the couch. And I asked him to help me to go to the bathroom to, uh, because I was going to be sick. Mm. And when when he did that, I passed out. Oh, no. I said... I said, you have to call the emergency room now when I woke up. I said, call the, call the paramedics and have them come get me because there's no way he could carry me. I live upstairs, and there's no way he could carry me downstairs. Yeah. So they came and got me and took me to the emergency room. I had a UTI. I had a bladder infection. If it could be infected, it was infected. So I was in, in the hospital seven days then. Oh, no. With IV antibiotics and everything. And after that, I went and had my catheter flushed. And it's been smooth sailing since then. Really? I have not had any problems whatsoever. None. Wow. The only problem that I have with PD is sometimes it causes, because, you know, it's nothing but sugar water, basically. Yep. Sometimes it activates this skin disorder in people and I'm one of those lucky people who got that Mm. um I have this condition called hydronitis supertiva and it's terrible I wouldn't wish it on anybody I'd rather have kidney failure oh it's you got these big sores on it it's terrible so is it (laughs) then you have to take more medicine so so is that like shingles um it's not like shingles you only get them in certain spots like I get them under my arms, which is just wretched. Okay. Because when I go to hang my bags, it irritates them. What? And I mean, it hurts. Sometimes they're the size of silver dollars. They hurt. Oh, wow. But my, and I never had this with my other dialysis. And when I took the the dermatologist that it was on PD dialysis, he said, yep, that's what it was. That's what caused it. Wow. He, he said, if you get a, a transplant, he said, it will most likely go away. Um, I spoke to another lady on dial, on PD dialysis. Well, she has had a transplant now, but who had the same skin condition. And she did PD, and she said it, hers started when she did PD, too. So huh. I'm hopeful it will go away with transplant. Well, I hope so. Are you on the transplant list? I'm very close. <laughs> I had to lose... Um, a lot of weight okay. because my kidneys cause me to gain a lot of weight. What? But I've lost 75 pounds mm-hmm. and I have to lose eight more pounds. Oh my okay. gosh, that's amazing. Right. And the eight more pounds is being extremely stubborn, which I woke up this morning and it was, I only need to lose like three more pounds. So, oh wow, that's amazing. Hopefully, that's not a fluke with my scale. Yeah, no kidding. Yeah. Okay, so you've, and then, okay, so you've had two fistulas, numerous grafts, I've you're on two PD. Fistulas, and two you, fistulas, five grafts, three neck catheters, one femoral catheter. Explain to us the femoral catheter, because not many people uh, know about that one. A femoral catheter is terrible. Oh. They put them in the top of your leg, and it goes up through your groin and, you know, to your heart. So you can't, you know, at least when you have a neck catheter, you can take a shower. Okay. With this, with the femoral cath, nothing. You no. take bird baths. It's terrible. Oh, bird no. baths is it. And with my one, it did nerve damage to my leg. So now I can help and pick my right leg up. Like, 
I can't pick it up higher than like knee level. It's because it, it did the damage to my nerve in it. Oh my goodness. But when they do that, you can't you can't wear normal clothes like when you go to dialysis you have to wear you can't wear shorts because you freeze to death. Yeah. Obviously. So I had to take I had some old sweats and I took and I cut holes in them where my catheter hose would come out. And the looks you get when you have one of those is crazy. Aww. People are looking at you like, what's hanging out of you? Yeah, what right. is that? <laughs> That's my lifeline, people. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Wow. But, well, girl, yeah. you sure have been through it. You're going to have to come back on and give us some updates and hopefully transplants your update. I had 21 surgeries to successfully be able to have dialysis. Jeez. Oh, that's ridiculous. That well, is I just... Know. I've enjoyed telling y'all my story. Gosh. Well, we like to uh, kind of end and follow up things with, uh, since we've called the the group and the site Living on Dialysis. How would you say that you are living on dialysis? Oh my gosh. I take my bags everywhere. I go and do whatever I want to go do. I, I do my dialysis in the car all the time and I get some strange looks when I get out to put my drain in the truck. <laughs> I go do what I want to do. Ain't, ain't nothing going to keep me from living my life. That's awesome. I love that. That is exactly what we try to promote. Um, yeah, I, I go, I go shop. I do my own grocery shopping. I, I, you know, the only thing that I don't do that if I had my own swimming pool, I would. But that's the only thing I can't do that I want to do is go swimming. Yeah. But, but because I have a, I have a public pool that I don't trust. <laughs> yeah, I wouldn't either. But other than that, I do whatever I want to go do. Well, I'm gonna that, go. that is awesome. I, well, you're definitely going to have to come on for an update. And for now, um, thank you for coming on the podcast. You're amazing. Something we forgot this about what we did this week is we actually went up camping with all of John's kids and Chris's kids. And we won't get into the... Uh, Stuff that Chris and his kids did with my ATVs. But we will, we took Oliver up there. And if you haven't heard about Oliver, he actually had a CBC as well. He had a bone marrow transplant. And the cutest thing is. Go he, ahead. Didn't, he didn't like his CVC call, being called a CVC. He said it was scary. So he named it Charlie. Yep. And then uh, he had that one pulled or it got ripped out. So then he had another one. It was Charlie 2.0. So, Casey, if you're listening to this, that was freaking genius. And she helped us with a whole bunch of supplies when uh, Christina got hers. But uh, we went camping. We set it up on the deck. And yes, I know, we were outside. and da, 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 da. We had a cover but above us. We had a cover. And... We masked. We sanitized. We even made the kids stay off the deck, which was almost absolutely impossible with 10, 12, 15 kids. How many kids does John have? Uh, he has a lot, but he only had four there. Are you five sure? there. Are you sure? Because I swear there was like 20. No, there's five. Huh. Okay. Plus the three other kids makes it eight total. Plus Chris. Yeah, they count as kids. And stuff and you, that he did with my ATV. You and your brother John, you all count as kids. I don't think so. I think I'm the most responsible one, and I only do responsible things. Sure. Uh-huh. uh-huh. But anyways, we... Uh, Hooked uh, dialysis up. She swung in a hammock chair. And uh, she actually had a hummingbird right above her head. Yeah, it was amazing. It was awesome treatment. We had a few little hiccups. But it was nothing that we couldn't handle. And uh, it was cool as hell. And yeah, we just realized that I didn't have surgery this last Friday. It was the Friday before that. But yeah, so she's had so many. We just we just call them Friday surgeries. So... <laughs> Anyways, see you guys. Bye. Hey, guys. I know I reviewed this already, but it came out on streaming, and I just had to do it again. It is Top Gun Maverick, and it is 
absolutely amazing. If you have not seen it, you need to go see it. It has extras. Um, basically, it's about after more than 30 years of service as one of the Navy's top aviators, Pete Mitchell, is where he belongs, pushing the envelope as a courageous test pilot and dodging the advancements in rank that would ground him. And then it stars Tom Cruise, um, Val Kilmer, Jennifer Connelly, Miles Till, uh, Rachel Saludin, um, John Hamm, Charles Parnell, Monica Barbello. I mean, just name after name after name. So I suggest you go see this, and here is the trailer. What do we have here? Yeah, here I thought we were special. Fellas, this here's Bagman. Hangman. Whatever. What the hell kind of mission is this? Everyone here is the best there is. Who the hell are they going to get to teach us? Captain Pete Maverick Mitchell. Let me be perfectly blunt. You are not my first choice. You are here at the request of Admiral Kazansky, a.k.a. Iceman. He seems to think that you have something left to offer the Navy. What that is, I can't imagine. With all due respect, sir, I'm not a teacher. I just want to manage expectations. What the hell? Good morning, aviators. This is your captain speaking. And we're off. Here we are. In three, two, one. We're going into combat on a level no living pilot's ever seen. Not even him. You think up there you're dead. Believe me. I'm not going to make the same mistake. So he's not coming back from this. Those are your pilots. Anything happens to them. Smoke in the air! Smoke in the air! You'll never forgive yourself. No turning back now. Yet. Okay, so that movie is absolutely amazing. It has extras, it has the making, the fact that they that they flew every single jet. It is absolutely amazing. If you like the first Top Gun, oh my God, you're going to absolutely love this one. I love uh, irritating Christina because anytime I come down from the mountains, I start that song playing. And she goes, oh my gosh, but it is such a good song. And the Lady Gaga song that she does is absolutely amazing too. There is not one bad part in this movie. So go watch it, go own it, see it a million times. See you guys. Hey guys, it's Mike and Christina, and this is Living on Dialysis Podcast. So we are talking today about uh, fish oil and gloves. Do um, you want to tell them about your week? Uh, do I have to? Well, let's, uh, let's go ahead and start with Friday because that's when we posted our last one. Why don't you go ahead and tell them what you did Friday? So on Friday, I went in for surgery. I was, for some reason, every time we hooked up to the graft, I was getting this awful pressure in my arm that just get it got harder and harder and harder and it felt like my arm was gonna blow up so we would have to pull the needles around an hour so I went in for sur- surgery with the original doctor that placed it and he kind of he kind of didn't think there was a problem so he went in there and checked out the veins and everything and he says yeah there's there's no problem and he kind of even said, uh, dia- he actually said dialysis doesn't feel good. So you're just going to have to 
deal with it and it should go away. And he was also saying I had, I was having phantom pains, like remembering what my fistula felt like. And I was like, no, my fistula never felt like that. So I went back to my original vascular surgeon that I've gone to the whole time and (laughs) went in for surgery. Uh, Yesterday. Yesterday. Wow, it was yesterday. So went in for surgery yesterday and we get wheeled back and my doctor comes walking out and we start talking to him and... I lift up the the gown, my sleeve on the gown to show him my CVC, and he instantly says, well, that's the problem. And we were like, what do you mean, that's the problem? And he said, he showed us how I have a ton of little veins on my right shoulder, and I don't on my left shoulder. And he said that's because there's so much pressure built up in there that the CVC is pushing all the blood to that arm. So my body was making new veins to hold the blood. Which is absolutely crazy. And um, so first off, Friday, when the doctor actually said that, it actually extremely pissed me off. And if you follow the group, you can see how pissed off I was because I posted a video that basically was saying, no, dialysis is not supposed to hurt. Okay, it's not a walk in the park or rainbows or anything like that. But to add pain on top of it, that is the stupidest thing I ever heard. And that's where we push so much about being your own advocate and getting additional answers. And um, like I've said before, my mom has always said, ask the question three times because eventually you're going to get the right answer. Always, like on the first one, it's nope, nope, I'm perfect, I don't mess up. Then the second one, it's like, "Mm, I don't know, it's, uh, you know, they might think about it. And then the third time, they're like, they're actually going to think about it. And whether that's a second opinion, third opinion, fourth opinion, keep going and getting opinions until you get the answer you want. I think that's the number one thing I've learned throughout my years of all this medical stuff is that don't be afraid to get a second opinion. And most of the time, it will make you feel better. And I've noticed most of the time, they catch what the other one didn't. Absolutely. And I will say that this process sucked. Because anytime Christina goes under the knife, I have a mini panic attack. I know I joke a lot and I'm sarcastic. But that's a cover for me as well. Because it just makes it easier for me to handle all of it. And I won't say we made a mistake with everything we did because our original surgeon didn't even want to put a graft in the, in the same arm as your fistula. So if we went with his opinion, we would have had the graft in the other arm, which you didn't want to give up yet. And then when we went back to him, it was an immediate, oh, this is the problem. So, yes, it really sucks, but always get a second opinion, third opinion, and don't ever accept the fact that dialysis is just going to hurt. Or that it's, it'll, it'll go away in a couple months. You just have to give it time. Yeah, that, that is absolute horseshit. Because just when, when, when you get answers like that and they just feel long... Reach out to someone. Reach out to someone that's been on dialysis or an advocate or anything like that because I can guarantee you there's somebody that has went through this. And if anything, we give experience to other people that may be having the same thing. And and it was absolutely crazy when this doctor, we were talking to him and stuff, and he happens and he happens to just say, hey, let me see what the previous surgeon did. And if he wouldn't have done that, it, it, it almost seemed like he wanted to send us home to let her heal up a little bit more. It was almost like he was he wanted pushing. To do some other tests. He wanted to do some other tests. He wanted to do some other things until we, until we finally, because I don't think he knew, he knew she had a CV, uh, CVC. And then when we mentioned, he's like, oh, well... So he pulls back and looks like, oh, what's that? 
And it was plain as day when he mentioned it because it was comparing to the other shoulder. It looked like spider webs on a shoulder on the side with the CVC. And this petrified me because that CVC is my failsafe. It's my go-to. If there's a problem with cannulating or if there's a problem with the graft or whatever... I knew I had that CBC that I could just connect to. I didn't have to worry about needles. I didn't, and that scared the living shit out of me. But Christina was confident. This doctor was confident. And so they took her back and did this. So I had my mini panic attack. I called my mom immediately, you know, almost cried at her. Oh, they're taking out the CBC. Oh, what am I going to do? Hey, I thought you said you did cry. Eh, I'm fairly manly, so... Let's just say I didn't. Hey, manly men cry. Yeah. Anyways. So, you know, I, and on, you know, anytime I have a issue or I don't know how to handle something, it's usually I call my mom and dad. You know, if I want my mom to say, oh, you, you're a good boy. You know, I call my mom. But if I want the brutal truth, it's my dad and he'll tell me to buck up and man up and get back in there. So, and this is where the coolest thing happened. And so the surgeon comes out and he comes and kind of explains to me what happened. He pulled the CBC and, oh, well, Christina's getting a call. Oh, okay. So we end up, so he's talking to me and I don't know if I have the look of Michael's a dummy face or if I've been throwing out enough lingo that I sound like, that I know what I sound like. And uh, so he goes, well, come with me. And he pulls me back in the air wall. And I go in there and Christina is just covered in blood. I mean, it's basically any any TV show that you've seen where it's in the air wall and there's, there's gauze and there's blood. And I mean, it, 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 was, it was brutal. And I walk in there and I'm trying to listen to the doctor. And the only thing I'm thinking is, um, okay, don't pass out, don't pass out, don't pass out, don't pass out, don't pass out. And he gets done talking. And behind the cover, I hear, hey, honey, I love you. And I'm like, holy shit, you're awake? And she's like, yeah. And I'm like, well, honestly, thank God we weren't talking shit on you. So, and then she starts telling me about the nurses and how they're writing down books for her to read. And, and this is all why, you know, she's covered in blood and her arms wide open. And so we go ahead and do that. And they, they send us home with actually some catheters in her arm. And I think they're like 8 gauge, 10 gauge. Yeah, they're but huge. But they are some huge needles. And it's not really the needles. It's when you get an IV and they leave that plastic sheath inside you. It's the same thing except on steroids. It's this big, big needle. and It's like a temporary CVC coming out of your graft. Yeah. And so basically he just left it. He taped them down. And, you know, that freaked me out too because, you know, that could snag on anything. And, you know, the entire day was just a mind mess of emotions and what are we going to do? So we get home, we do dialysis, and the pressures are amazing. They're, they're actually, gone. Yeah, they're actually so low that I called my nurse saying, hey, are these too low? And once she knew the gauge and how, how the needles were and stuff, you know, it, it was no problem. So anyways, that was all week. Yeah. Um, so... Yeah, if anything, Christina definitely makes life interesting and always keeps you on your toes. So we're going to go into the history of the fissure and the graft. So, like I said, I do the boring mumbo jumbo stuff and then Christina will let you know her experience with her stuff. Um, the history of a fissure, the fissure is a connection that can be formed between a vein and an artery for dialysis. A graft is a piece of plastic that is inserted to connect the vein and the artery for dialysis. 
Fissure is the preferred method. And graft is basically the backup if your veins aren't big enough or they can't place one. Um, anytime, you put an un, anytime you put a man-made item into your body, your body is going to want to eject that um, in one way or another. So fissures are definitely the go-to. Um, another thing to actually be careful about is if you happen to be searching for fissure, there's actually a thing called uh, anal fissure, which is serious too, and it's extremely medical, but is exactly what you think it is, but uh, down in your bum hole. It's uh, veins that have expanded and yeah, so you really have to go there. I, I didn't mean to, My but goodness. I type it in, and then that stuff comes up, and I'm starting to write notes, and I start writing this down. Oh. And I'm like, what the hell? I'm like, what the hell is she having this place? And then I read into it, and it's, it they actually name it a stupid thing, so I'm not gonna say it again. But they should call it like. Big bum hole something. I don't know. Oh my god. Yeah, I know. It's gross. So okay, it, when you're when on. you're yeah, when you're looking up fissures, just make sure you uh make sure you're typing in dialysis with that because you're gonna get some uh vivid images and descriptions. Alright, so the first fissure was used in nineteen thirty on kids that actually got polio. Um, when they became paralyzed to keep the limbs alive, they would place fissures in an attempt to keep the limbs growing. It didn't work because, well, when kids had polio back then, they usually died. And so there was very low success rate with this. And uh, as I said before, the first successful dialysis patient was in 1943 by Dr. Koff. But this was not too effective because the amount of blood that they have to pull, um, they weren't pulling enough blood to clean it. So it, when you... If, you, if you're not using fissures and glass, you're not pulling enough, so your body is creating more toxins that you can even pull. Um, in 1960, Dr. Scribner still called the Scribner shunt. Um, this was a Teflon graft placed on the outside of the skin, connected to the vein in the elderly, but this was prone to many, many infections because it was just hanging on the side of your arm. That's insane. Yeah, so basically you had a screw-type connection that when you connected to dialysis, you would unscrew it, you would connect to the arterial side, you connect oh, to the vein my. side, and then when you're done, you just screw them together. Oh my and God. so, one, they didn't really even understand what fissures and glass were doing, but the amount of infection that came from this was absolutely nuts. That's insane. Um, so... That that's basically the history. There's not much to it. Um, dialysis has basically been the same since 1940, 1950. Fissures, glass, CBCs. It's really the main ways that you can do dialysis. Um, as you heard with the person, uh, uh, what's the, what was her name? Angel Duncan. You know she had five fissures or two fissures, two fissures. five glass numerous CBCs, and then a femoral yeah. CBC, and which... in your leg. Yeah, which uh, instead of your chest CBC, the one that goes straight to your heart, it is in your leg, and it's going to that main artery that runs and into... And it actually your... runs, like, across your groin mm -hmm. and up. And so, apparently, the pain in your groin area and your upper leg is... Just super intense with it. And then when you had your first fissure, I may be jumping around, but you had that vein moved from your leg into your arm, right? No, no, no. No? I got my fistula placed the same way everybody else does. And my fistula, I had, I had the problem of it, of it growing too big. And so we had to try to slow down the growth of it. So they actually did a drill procedure. They went in my leg and took my artery out and they went in and connected my artery to the bottom of the fistula. Okay. And the hope was that that artery would slow the blood down before it got in the fistula. But okay. It didn't. All right. So let's go ahead and start over because we kind of jumped around with your, with your fistula. Let's go ahead and start with when you were first told that you needed to get a fissure. Let's go ahead and 
go through that process a little bit? Um, honestly, it's really hard to remember. I think that I had so much going on in my life and I was having a custody battle at that time. I was getting a fistula. I had this newborn baby that had her own illnesses and it's it's hard to remember. I, all I really do remember is recovery after the fistula surgery. And I am a very vain person. And after my first surgery, I straighten my hair because I have naturally frizzy hair. It's not curly. It's just frizzy. And so I straighten my hair and it takes a long time and I couldn't hold a blow dryer. And so I actually remember being in the bathroom and crying and just crying and crying. And my mom came in and she said, here, honey, let me straighten your hair for you. And it meant the world to me because you don't realize when you don't have that arm, which the things you can't do. And so I remember that whole recovery. I was just awful. I had the hardest time like not using my arm. So let me ask you on that. When you had your official place, you had it, you had it placed in your right arm. Was there a reason you had it placed in the right or the left? Or did you even get an option? I did not get an option. Okay, so on that, any time you have an option to put it in your non-dominant arm, do it. Um, another thing is have it placed as low as possible. I don't know if that was possible with you. But make sure you get, make sure you ask that question like three times. Are you sure I can't put it in my wrist? Are you sure I can't put it in my forearm? Because anytime you move up, you cannot have a fissure or a graft or anything below that. And that's kind of the thing we're running into right now is her fissure is placed somewhat high in her elbow, yeah, lower shoulder. High. And so you only have that limited space. And so when they place the graft, they placed it in your bicep. And if we knew what we knew now, you know, we could have asked him, hey, one, can we put this in my left arm? I straighten my hair. I do this. I write. I, you know. So anytime you can put it in your non-dominant arm, definitely do it. Well, and at the at the time, um, I remember... I I think I was 24 mm-hmm. when I got my fistula placed. And at the time, I I was just this young girl. It was the first surgery I ever had other than C-section with my daughter. And um, the doctor basically said, you got better veins in the right arm. And I, they said, what's your dominant arm? And I said, right. And they said, well, those veins are better. We're going to go ahead and place it. Okay. And at the time, I didn't know the questions to ask. I didn't know the things to say. So I figured that those doctors were doing the best they could for me. And and I'm sure they did do the best. And but but that's where this that's where the group and the podcast come in really handy for if you have questions or the doctors tell you this or that, get on the group and ask questions. They may be right or that one question might be, oh yeah, why don't we put it down here? You know, and they might they might come back with an answer of, oh, it's the only place we can put it. And it might even be, and, hey, maybe I need to go see another doctor and see if they have the same opinion. Yeah, and Christina actually has small veins. So it could have been that this was the only place. And just like, just like when she had a graft placed, the original doctor, not the one that placed her, her fistula, but the, but the original doctor we went and talked to said, no, we can't put it in that arm. And we're like, well, we're not ready to give up her other arm yet. Because if you don't know, when you get a fistula, you cannot do IVs in that arm. You cannot do blood pressures. Uh, blood pressures. So if she had a fistula put in the other arm, we would, do be, we, bleh, we would be doing blood pressures on her leg. If she had an IV that needed to be placed, it would have to be done in your leg. Right? Mm-hmm. I mean, yeah. and that just sounds absolutely miserable. I mean, an IV in your hand is bad enough. Can you imagine them fishing around in your leg? So, anyways, so, question, when, when you had your fish oil placed, you knew you were getting a transplant. 
What? Did you know at that time? Or... No. Well, it was in the works, but I we knew that I might go on dialysis before the transplant was all ready to go. So, did they give you the option for a CBC during that time? Because it, cause it, cause no. it seems... Okay, so... Why did they want you to get a fissure if you knew... I mean, I guess you didn't know because that Brian was a match. You didn't know... There's no guarantee okay. that you're going to keep the kidney. There's no... With, the, with this dialysis stuff, you go with what presents itself. And so you think you have a plan, and the next day that plan's gone, and you've got to come up with a new one. And so having that fish to a place guaranteed that when I did need dialysis, I could go get it. Okay, so let's go ahead and jump forward. Um, you've rejected your kidneys again. Um, you had a CBC placed. And then that's when we started exploring the options of fissure, graft. Can we... See, tell them about the mistake we made somewhat with the fissure. About getting it tied off and stuff like that. Oh, well, after I had got my second transplant, I had had it for a year. And my doctors all told me that it could hurt my heart. to So to go get it tied off. And this, this fistula, it was a champ. Like, it had no problems. It was just a fighter. And so I, again, did as I was told, and I went and had it tied off. And I found out just shortly after that that full rejection was going to happen. That's when we were fighting it, and we should have just kept it. But, again, I did what I was told and tied it off. So am I allowed to tell the story about, uh, that was pretty much the first surgery that I was part of, and I was sitting right there with your mom. Am I allowed to tell that story? Hey, it's sure, funny as hell. but if you have kids, you should probably <laughs> plug their ears. All right, so, so I met Christina. She starts rejecting. They know that, well, this was before she was rejecting. And it is actually true that if you have a fissure and you're not using it, you are putting... That extra work in your heart. So, I mean, it's it's rolling of the dice. I mean, we couldn't tell the future that you're going to reject your kidney. Yeah, we couldn't. But at the same time, the doctor's telling you, listen, this thing is making your heart go wild. And like she said, this was a, this was a damn good fissure. So... We go to that? Do we do it again? Do we not? I mean, if, if we knew we were going to reject, then yes, definitely don't untie it. Definitely don't, don't tie it off. But, I mean, that's, that's something to ask two, three doctors because I, I, I don't know. I don't know what we would have done if the doctor came to us and said, hey, this is, this is running your heart ten times more than what it should. I, 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 I don't know what our conversation would have been on that. Yeah. I don't know. I mean, and, and it's, it's every single surgery is going to be different. But that's definitely a conversation to have with two, three doctors um, but anyways, so this was like right after I met Christina, we were dating, we were, you know, I, I don't even think we were engaged at that point. And we go to the doctor with Robin and that's I, was my mother. Yeah. And that's, that's the, that's the famous mom, the mother-in-law that I love to, uh, give crap to. Um, I only do it cause, uh, I love seeing your expression and it's absolutely fun. But, uh, so so anytime you go into have surgery, they have you gown up. And I remember they give her the gown and we're just sitting there and Christina just, well, I think she waits there for a second. Uh, like, I, I looked from like you to her and her to you and nobody was moving. Well, I, and I'm a, I'm a dumbass. I'm just sitting there like, oh, okay, well, and then boobies. I'm like, oh my gosh. And I look over at Robin, and I'm like, that's nice, huh? Hey, <laughs> that's the only thing I could think. And she goes, and she goes, oh, my goodness. I'm like, well, they all are. And she puts the gown on, and pretty much that was my first interaction of medical with your mom. Yeah, it was. So, there's that. Sorry, Robin, but they all nice. So, um, so you have your graft placed. Mm-hmm. 
You want to tell them about that process? Um, so it's just like getting a fistula. You go under and you come out with it and you just have a few more scars to go with a graft because they actually have to put an item in there. And so there's a, there's a few big cuts, but yeah, it's a very similar process. But after I got it, I kind of learned how different fistulas and grafts are. There's a lot of differences and they're kind of silly little things, but like with a fistula, you use a tourniquet when you're sticking the needles. You never use a tourniquet on a graft. So that's one thing I was kind of caught off guard by. Okay. And what about what about buttonholes? You cannot have buttonholes in a graft. You can in a fistula. Something I learned on buttonholes is you have to have a layer of fat on your arm or leg or wherever. At, at least that's what I've been told in order to have buttonholes. You have to have a tunnel that it can go through. Really? Yeah. So even even if your fissure was where it is, I mm-hmm. don't think you could have buttonholes. Even oh. with your old fissure, just because it sat so high on your skin. Some people's fissures are, you know, kind of hard to see, or it's under the skin, or, you know, if you're a bigger person, you have that layer of fat on top of it, and you need that tunnel to create the chamber. Yeah, so, I don't know. Yeah, I, I I don't know if that's right or wrong. If I'm wrong, call me out. T- let me know. But that's what I was told. So even when I asked him about, well, because I heard there's a process where you can actually, in when you're in surgery, you can place the buttonholes. You can place the, there's a the plastic tubes. chamber tube that they can place so that it starts the well, you keep scarring it, process. You keep it in for like three weeks, I mean, two to three weeks. Yeah. And so when you pull it out, you've got that channel mm-hmm. ready to go. And when, when I asked the doctor that, he didn't even say, well, I can't do that because it's a glass. She's like, she's too thin. She won't have buttonholes. And I'm like, what? And, I'm like, yeah. and he's like, yeah, you have, to have a, you have to have something that the tube can be placed in. If it's just the skin that you're poking through on a needle, that you you can't. So that's when you have to do the train track pattern. And so um, another difference between fissure and graft, at least in my experience, I didn't I didn't ever uh, cannulate a fissure, but you, they went straight through. I mean, how many times when you first had your fissure? Oh, over and over and over again. And That's when I had my lovely uh, tattooed, bruised arm that I m- made my dad look like a abuser. Yeah. Love you, Dad. And the graft is actually a little bit different because it's it's basically a, a Teflon hose in your skin where you can hear it pop yeah. as you're going in. And it kind of just... At least with the times that we've been successful with cannulating, is you hear the pop and then you just it just kind of channels right through it. Um, I haven't been the best with cannulating. I I do really great with the first one, but the second one, I don't know. I think I let my emotions get a hold of me because anytime I make a flinch or hurt a little bit, I get frustrated. But it could have been the pressure too. So so we had the CBC. We moved, and the the only thing we can think is the amount of pressure that you lost with not having the CBC, trying to place needles today, actually, was extremely difficult. We, I, I could get it started, but then it just went away. And we don't know if it's because she's still in trauma through surgery, so her body's just in defense mode. I don't know. Yep, so, we'll just have to try it again tomorrow. Yeah, we even had the nose here, and she wiggled the needle around, and, and I hate doing that, too, because, I mean, we've all had IVs placed, and they wiggle around, and I'm doing that with the 16-gauge needle, so I see her flinching, and she's she's a tough-ass woman, but it sucks. So, that sucks. Yeah. But, but there are a few differences... 
that I kind of noticed, like if you pull a needle from a fistula, you're going to get blood across the room and it's going to look like a murder scene way, like within seconds. And the graft is not that intense. We have actually had really good success just putting the gauze on it, putting pressure on it for a couple minutes and it pretty much stays. And I, I thought we would have the fistula like reaction, but no, it's, it's a lot easier with a graft. Yeah. And you have a really badass dialysis tech that's really strong with really strong hands. Yeah, sure. Yeah. That's okay. me, by the way. That's what we're, that's, that's what, what we're, we're going with. Yeah. That I'm freaking amazing. Okay. Well, um, I'm yeah. actually kind of proud of this one, but, uh, when she was in the operating room, when you can go ahead and tell them about the medical with me. What? Uh, well, they thought I, okay, you're oh, lame. yeah. Yeah, so the nurses were talking to me, and they asked me if Mike was in the medical field. And I said, no, he's a jet mechanic. And they were like, no way. And they were like, he really knows what he's talking about. I think that's why the surgeon came and pulled me in, because I, I just kind of know my niche when it comes to this stuff. And I'm yeah, throwing but, out I'm throwing out lingo that I don't that more that normal people just don't have. So But I talked better than you, but I was just already in the operating room. Well, you and they're talking about books and Yeah, I actually all these books on tape. In fact, when she came out of surgery, the the nurse gives me a post it and she's like, Hey, you need you you need to take this. And I'm thinking it's a prescription or it's how to cannulate or what I do. And I'm like, well, what the hell is this? She's like, oh, well, that's a book that we recommend for her to read. <laughs> I'm <laughs> like, oh, uh, okay, my wife is in the cut open and you're giving me a book? And she's like, yeah, we were just talking about it just now. I told her I'd write it down. Yeah, and the book sounds amazing. Like... <laughs> If I'm going into surgery, I'm going to talk to them, and I have no idea where that's going to go. We went to books, and they had amazing taste in books. <laughs> so, that is our experience with fish oil and glass. I know everybody has a whole bunch. Um, Angel Duncan had tons and tons oh, of stories. Yeah. So, uh, if you have an amazing story, let us know. And... Uh, Basically, that's it. Take care of yourselves, guys. Yep, we will see you guys next week. Okay, bye. See ya. Hi, guys. This is Christina's Crazy Corner, and today we have a newbie. I'm super excited. She is all the way from Florida. Her name is Tiff. How are you, Tiff? Good. How is everyone? You sound so happy. It's so cute. <laughs> I love it. I love it. I'm so excited. And we also have Susie. Hi, guys. And of course, we have Tyler J. Hi. Okay, Ty, what do that we got for today? not a happy hi. Hi. Enthusiasm. Hi. That's better. <laughs> got this. Okay, so today we're going to be talking about some of the craziest cat facts that you probably don't know. Cat Ooh. facts? I just watched a documentary. I know everything. I did too. Oh. On Netflix. Yes. Same. <laughs> what is it? This, is the, the info from the documentary? No, or it's else? from uh, Animal so Health. Don't... Okay. Okay. Okay, let's do it. Let's do it. Okay, so unlike dogs, cats don't have a sweet tooth. This could be due to a mutation in a key taste receptor. Okay, so are we talking literally a tooth or are we talking like sweets. wanting sweets? Sweets, like candy. They don't really? like sweets, huh? They so don't if like you sweets. put like chocolate down, they're not going to go for it? No, they're not. They never do. Huh, that's <laughs> <what I'm> <laughs> <trying>. <laughs> <laughs> they never I've just do. I've had cats and they never go for the treats, but the dogs do. I have had a cat go do. for treats. Oh, you have? Lemmy thinks he's a dog. Like so. sweet treats? Yeah. Like yes. cookies like or something? Like the kid's candy. Wow. Oh. Yeah, he never goes for it all. Yeah. yeah. He oh. had a mutation or something. he also likes rides in the car and yeah. he thinks he's a dog. He's a dog. He is he's a crazy dog. dog. He's a crazy he's, cat. But most of them know, huh? He's a dog in a cat's body. That's how he feels. <laughs> This is how he identifies. <laughs> okay, what's next? All right, so on average, cats spend two-thirds of every day sleeping and use one-third of their awake time cleaning themselves. So all they do is sleep and clean? 
That sounds awful. Well, the, that's only one third of their wake time. The two thirds of their wake time, they do whatever. Oh. No, two thirds of their time is spent sleeping. So, two how many cats does everyone sleeping here have? And use one third of their awake time. Ah, one okay, third of their awake okay. time. How many cats does everyone have? One. We, one? Okay, what about you, you Sus? Four. We I have four leave. as well. Yes, I'm not the only four. one. Four. Yes. So that means if one third, how how long do they sleep? No. So they sleep for two thirds of their day. Oh my gosh, that is insane. Mine sleeps for more. She's seventeen. Oh, oh yeah. understandable. <laughs> so she just sleeps at this point. Yeah. I'm seventeen too. I sleep a lot. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> it's a teenager and an old cat thing. Exactly. Yeah. That's so funny. You guys want to get it? <laughs> so Miley is our old cat, and she sleeps a lot too, and she spends the rest of her time knocking over drinks. That's her Excellent. Yeah. Your cats have so they some have neat crazy. Talents. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. All right. Next one. The technical term for a hairball is a bezoar. A, a bezoar, like in Harry Potter. Bezoar. 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 B e z o a r. Bezoar. Hmm. I like that better than hairball. Yeah, I like that too. Yeah. Go get your bezoar and get it out of here. Yeah. Yeah, I like that. Okay. All right. Next one. A group of cats is called a clouder. Clouder? Mm-hmm. This was not on the documentary. <laughs> who, who came up with that one? Clouder? Look, there's clouder. a bunch of cats over there. It's a clouder. Yeah. It's a clouder right there. It's like a cloudy day, but with cats. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Gosh. Clouder. Right. Next one. Cats can be left pod or right pod. Female oh. cats tend to be right pod, while male cats are usually left pod. Interestingly, left-handed humans also tend to be male. Oh, that's interesting. Okay, so I got a couple things. One, like, why do they need to be right or left-handed? Because, like, if they start jumping, they put one paw up first. When they knock over cups, they gotta have a dominant one. (laughs) (laughs) Okay, and then um, I've always thought it was really weird that me and all my sisters married guys with left hand that are left-handed. All and all you? our brothers are yeah, right-handed. Oh wow. wow! All of our husbands are left-handed. Wow! So, huh. Isn't left hand kind of rare? Mm-hmm. I guess I don't not. know a lot of left-handed people. She it said more better. men are left-handed. It's well, still rare, though. maybe it's still rare. Yeah. Good call. Huh. Good call. <laughs> okay, keep going. <laughs> okay. Cats make about a hundred different sounds, while dogs make up only about ten. Are cats smarter? I we'll think get they that. are. They basically... I think they feel like they're smarter. They just don't care. They can take care of themselves. Like, what are humans for? Yeah. Just to put the food in a bowl. Yeah. That's yeah. it. We'll get to that part. Okay. But the next one, actually, is it? A cat's brain is biologically more similar to a human brain than it is to a dog's. Cats are smarter. Both humans and cats have identical regions in their brains that are responsible for emotions. Whoa, so your cat, like, can get feels sad. sad or happy? They can get depression. Yeah. That's actually a thing. Lemmy gets angry, <gasps> for sure. Yeah. So does Dusky Boy. Dusky's. <laughs> he went through a phase, but he's, like, grown out of it now. And now he's, like, old man Dusky. Well, mm. no, he still gets pissed off if I move wrong. Well, yeah. <laughs> Don't move. <laughs> yeah, exactly. <laughs> That's your fault. I'm on these long trips. She does. Mm-hmm. Oh. And then they, are, they like, retaliate. They'll start peeing everywhere in there. <laughs> yeah. She just expects a lot of love when I get home. Like, we That's had dogs cute. come over, and all of a sudden everyone peed all over the house because they weren't happy about it. <laughs> no. And you have dogs as well. Yeah, yeah. it just That's wasn't the funny our dogs. Part. <laughs> yeah. They're particular, for sure. Yeah. <laughs> okay, right. T. The oldest pet cat was found in a 9,500-year-old grave on the Mediterranean island of Cyprus. Contrary to popular cat facts, this predates Egyptian pet cats by 4,000 years. That was on the documentary. What? They've been around a lot longer than we thought. It has a pet, right? Mm -hmm. Uh Uh-huh. It was buried with someone, they said. They found one in someone's grave, like, with them. Oh, my gosh. Why were they digging this person up? I don't know. It's a whole other topic. Let's just leave them alone. (laughs) My goodness. (laughs) They okay. found a cat mummy. <laughs> yeah. All right. Cats are n- cats are North America's most popular pets. Cats really? outnumber dogs seventy three million to sixty three million. Wow. 
Only 30% of North American homes have a cat. Hmm. Wow. I think wow. cats are kind of easier because you don't have to walk them. You don't yeah. have to, you know what I mean? You feed They're them and they do their thing. It's just, it seems like I could totally see that. I do not like cats though. Yeah. Cats, you know? Not well. You don't. Well, I know. You don't have to clean them. You don't have to groom them most of the time. If you have like yeah, a long-haired cat, right. then that's just a nightmare. Yeah. 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 Then, then you they're... just have to shave them in the summer. Yeah. So I think they're essentially <laughs> easier, they in my easier, opinion. But, but I thought this is that society people they were dogs or cats, but yeah, that's very interesting. Yeah, very interesting. Don't listen, Moose. You're gonna just be sad. Okay. We love our puppies. We too. prefer you. <laughs> Okay, Ty. All right. Some cats have survived falls over 65 feet. Their eyes and balance organs in the inner ear help cats to right themselves in midair and land on their feet. Yeah, their eyes cool. and ears? Mm-hmm. Wow. It's pretty freaking cool. And they so... can, like, flip midair, just land on their feet. Yep. Yeah. And a little boy threw a cat out of the St. Augustine lighthouse. Are you serious? Yeah. What? There's a fun Florida fact. <laughs> did, did this did the cat, cat survive? Live? Um, I can't remember. I was it your it was, little boy? No, it was okay. years and years ago in the lighthouse. It was an operation. <laughs> I'm just it's kidding. one of the stories when you drop in it. That the little brother got mad at the little sister and threw the cat off it. Well, what did the cat do? And I think the cat lived. <gasps> if I remember right, the cat lived. I certainly oh hope so. Oh my gosh. Yeah. And he could come back with his other eight lives and terrorize the little boy. And did the child get a timeout? Like okay. the 1800s. Oh, really? <laughs> yeah. Wow. Wow. Dang. Okay, T. All right. The oldest cat to give birth did oh. so at age 30 with no. two kittens. No wow. Way. A cat can live to be 30 years old? Yeah. A house cat? Is that cat mm-hmm. years or is that like 30? Human years. What is human years? Cat years. Human years. Um, is cat there, years. There is a cat years thing. What type of cat lives to be 30 years? I'm very concerned all seven. Um, a little, a little. You don't want your cat to live that long, do you? <laughs> Let's be oh my gosh, you're horrible. <laughs> Tiff wants her cat to die. No, I don't. What's your she cat's does. name? Meowser. Hey, Meowser. Meowser, don't let her feed you anymore. Okay? Okay, I gotta tell a fun side story. No. It's awesome. Okay, she says no. Okay. She thought it was the end of time for her cat. And she took it in and to have her put down. And they were like, no, she's a spring chicken. She's good. She's okay. fine. So I think she just thought she was getting maybe there. Maybe And then like... she wasn't. Well, okay, and so... then you're a preemptive killer. Yeah, maybe. Yeah. <laughs> Watch out, Nate. <laughs> <laughs> no, so but she's so old. She's like, she thought she was just, old. We had carpet and the cat started going in every single room. Okay. Okay, and I'm, I had another cat that happened to and she ended up having cancer and we had to put her down. So I thought so we she just prepared herself, kind of, oh, okay. and took her she in, and they're like, but no, she's, she's good. She just and doesn't like she sleeps by the my new house. house. Yeah. Right yeah. Right Not to make it sound like she was doing it on purpose, but they were like, no, she's fine. She's young. She's going to live forever. She actually yeah, might. Yeah, I just never thought 30. Yeah. I just like thinking you were doing it on purpose. Because <laughs> <laughs> why not? <laughs> yeah. No, I actually love her a lot, and yeah. she's a really good kitty. When she's not going in on your brand new carpet, brand new house. No one had lived there before. Brand new. Oh, so it wasn't cancer. It was just cat attitude. Yeah. She was making she was everybody know this is my house. Yeah, yes, we had to rip all yeah. the carpet out. We now have wood floors. Oh, wow. But she's, That's a good way to go anyways. It is. It is. Carpet's yeah, my gross. whole house Carpet's is wood floor. Disgusting. How old yeah. is she? You're 17. 17. Hmm. So she's got a lot of years left. Mm-hmm. Okay, T. Okay. So a female cat is called a queen or a molly. Oh, that's cute. Queen Molly. Queen or a Molly. Yeah, but I, I want I want both. Queen Molly. Yeah. Okay. For the win. Queen Mauser. Queen Mauser. Yeah. Yes. <laughs> that's good. Yeah. <laughs> All right. Cats are highly sensitive to vibrations and may be able to detect earthquake tremors 10 or 15 minutes before humans can. So if your cat oh. starts going bananas, just you know. prepare. Yeah. Get Get to safety. Take okay. your cat with you. My cat's always bananas, though. So, yeah. Mm. True. All right. <laughs> it's true. Uh, <laughs> blonde or brown color change in Siamese kittens depends on their body temperature. Siamese cats carry albino genes that work at a body temperature above ninety-eight degrees. 
degrees, degrees Fahrenheit. If these kittens are left in a very warm room, their their prints won't darken, and they'll they will still they will stay a creamy white all over. Wow. wow. So you can kind of determine their color, keeping them warm mm-hmm. or cold. Wow. Just freeze them for a couple weeks. <laughs> now who's the cat you killer? You got the darkest cat you could ever have, and he's also, dead. Also, it's mummified and ice cube, <laughs> but that's fine. Oh my goodness! <laughs> wow. <laughs> All right. <laughs> like dogs, cats only sweat through their paws. Oh wow! I didn't know, know that. that about dogs. I didn't know that either. They sweat through their paws. Huh. Huh. That's why they get so dirty. Yeah, I don't they know. know. It makes me wonder because Lemmy runs around and he, sometimes he's wet. And I'm like, are you hot? Are you sweaty? Maybe. What the heck is he getting into? Maybe. His whole body or just his paws? Like the back of him. Oh, yeah. He's into something. He's, yeah. But they like to sink a lot. So. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> okay, T. All right. With enough water, cats can tolerate temperatures up to 133 degrees Fahrenheit. Wow. What? No wonder my cat was okay when the AC died last week. Yeah. <laughs> You're dying, and the cat's like, come on, calm down. This is nothing. In Florida. No oh. AC. When our cool. AC died, the cats thought they were going to die. Oh, yours did? <clears throat> a couple years ago, was... and I walked in, and there was like a cat here laying on its side. A cat here. I'm like, oh my gosh, they were so dramatic. <laughs> That's funny. That is our funny. dogs were dramatic, but the cat was fine. Hmm. Huh. Okay, Ty. Right. A cat's nose pad has a unique pattern of ridges, just like a human fingerprint. Oh, wow. Really? Cool. Mm-hmm. Wow. You're like, one of my cats got into my food. I need a <laughs> nose print done. <laughs> nose prints for all of you. Yes, nose prints for all of you. <laughs> a cat has no collarbone, meaning it can fit through any opening smaller than its head. Oh, that's awesome. Are you kidding? Mm-hmm. Smaller than its head. Yep. Yeah. They just kind of wiggle through. That kind of explains a lot. Mm-hmm. Yeah. <laughs> I think in that documentary, they, like, did a circle of four inches, three inches, and they were trying to see, you know, how small they could fit through. It's insane. It doesn't look like they're going to fit, and they just go right there. Wow. This right. is crazy. A tower was built in Scotland for a cat named Towser in commemoration of her killing over 30,000 mice throughout oh. her lifetime. I like the name oh Towser. I know that is really is cute. That? I wonder how big the tower is. It was four feet high. Yeah, it's like a tiny cat <laughs> it was tower. just perfect for her. Yeah. And it was built by a six-year-old at the built. beach. <laughs> All right. And she she actually destroyed it the same day it was built. Yeah, <laughs> probably. But, but how many mice? That's 30,000. That's so many. But who counted it? I don't know. How accurate were they? I used to have a cat that would bring them to the doorstep as gifts. Oh. Like, and I, two, yeah, I can see counting three. them. Oh, Tyler, that's the 54 I get one them today. all the time. Tyler gets bugs. I've gotten a dead up. mouse too. You oh, yeah. have? I've gotten oh, birds. Yeah. And You've it's gifts. Birds. Like, you have to be appreciative. <clears throat> well, the thing is, actually, sometimes it can be gifts. Or they think that you are unable to hunt, hunt so they're yourself. trying <laughs> to teach you. Or they're hunting for oh, you. Oh, yes. Yeah. All either, this time I can't I just thought I was an idiot. Yeah, either they yeah. think you're incapable of hunting, or they're thinking, okay, look, I caught this thing, now it's your turn. <laughs> yeah, Not happening, right. buddy. This is going to be the last one. Yeah. All right, Isaac Newton invented the cat flap to stop his cat spithead from opening the door to his dark room and running light-sensitive experiments. Wow. Okay, wait. Okay. I need a repeat. Yeah. Okay. Isaac Newton invented the cat flap. Like the door flap thing. Yeah. Okay. okay. To stop Spithead. his cat Spithead from opening the door to his dark room and ruining light sensitive experiments. So the cat could come in, so, but it wouldn't. Ru- ru- yeah. But wouldn't okay, that still you... interrupt a dark room? No. It, yeah. He made it to where you can lock it, I'm sure. Well, I was thinking it would have light huh. to ruin Maybe it. if the cat went in in the bottom. Yeah, it's going to show Maybe very it's little not light. Enough. Oh, and that's so interesting. Who names right a around? cat Spithead? I know. I, know. I kind of like it. <laughs> I kind of like it. Get over here, Spithead. Yeah. I'm going to name my husband that from now on. <laughs> hey, Spithead. Mike, Come on. Sir yeah. Mike Spithead. Yeah. It works perfect. Yeah. Okay, guys. Well, thank you for joining in, and we'll see you next week. Bye, guys. Bye. Bye.